Today at Knox Artillery, we're going to talk about the tubes used to prime an 18th century cannon, a little history about them, and then show how we prepare our tubes for use in living history reenactments and artillery demonstrations. There were several ways to prime the cannons of the 1700s. One way was to use a priming horn, such as this one, to pour loose powder directly into the touch hole of the cannon. The touch hole, or as is more correctly called, the vent, was a small hole which led from the bore of the gun to the exterior of the barrel at the rear of the gun. This allows for an ignition source to find its way to the main charge, setting it off and firing around, or in our case for reenacting, a blank charge of powder. However, using loose powder is inefficient. It could require a lot of powder to reach the bore, and black powder is very messy. It leaves behind a residue, which could after a few rounds obstruct the vent. Additionally, if it is raining or if it is windy, the powder could get wet or blow away before the gun was ready to be fired. Eventually, other methods were devised, including using a hollow, hollow feather quill, a small reed, or a tube. The tin tubes, like the quill and the reed, were hollow in the middle and filled with a fast-burning powder composition or a strand of quick-burning match cord. This would allow the flame from the priming powder to directly impinge upon the main charge, allowing for consistent ignition. For a period description, let's turn to John Mueller's A Treatise of Artillery. First published in 1757 and a revision in 1780, this is one of the main and most widely used artillery manuals available to the artillerists in Washington's army during the American Revolution. This book is a must-have for anyone recreating 18th century artillery. It is filled with a wide array of information, from the metallurgic makeup of cannons, their construction and employment on the battlefield, to tables showing ranges of guns with various powder loads, various diagrams of guns and carriages, and much, much more. For today's discussion, let's turn to page 203. On 203, Mueller writes, Tubes used in quick firing. These tubes are here made of tin. Their diameter is two tenths of an inch, which is so as to just enter into the vent of the piece, about five or six inches long, with a cap above and cut slanting below in the form of a pen. And the point is strengthened with some solder so that it may pierce the cartridge. Through this tube is drawn in quick match, and the cap is filled with mealed powder moistened with the spirits of wine. To prevent the mealed powder from falling out by carriage, a cap of paper is tied over it, which is taken off when used. But lately, the cap is made of flannel steeped in spirits of wine and with saltpeter dissolved in it, and there is no occasion to take it off, since it takes fire as quick as loose powder. To look at an illustration of this description, we'll turn to page 48 of Adrian Cruana's British Artillery Ammunition, 1780, where there's a lovely diagram of a tube and a table below, which indicates the various lengths of tube that you would need for different types of artillery. For example, the longest here for a 24 pounder would require a tube that was 8.8 .8 inches in length, all the way down to a cohorn mortar, which would only need 3.6 inches. We have two examples of tin tubes here with us today. As you can see here, one is empty and one has some powder in it. This uh, indicates what the powder composition possibly could have looked like. As you can see, the top flange is cupped to accept the composition, which would fill the tube all the way down to the pointed end. It was pointed on that end, so it would be able to prick into a bag of powder on a fixed or semi-fixed piece of ammunition. For example, here we have a fixed, which means the powder is already fixed to the round. This would be a flannel bag full of powder attached to this three pound solid shot, ready for quick loading and firing. The tube would puncture this bag, allowing the fire to travel directly down the tube into the charge, setting it off. However, this tube isn't live. This is just black hobby sand for effect. We won't use these for firing at events, as when you fire a cannon, the pressure from the main charge igniting would propel these skyward, and we don't want someone injured by a flying sharpened piece of metal, just for show. These lovely tin tubes are made by Goose Bay Workshops, whose brazier Peter is a very talented craftsman. We'll include a link to his website in the description. Now that you have a better understanding of the history behind these tubes, let us head to the workshop so we can show you how we make up our version of a tube for priming a cannon. All right, welcome to Knox's workshop. On the bench today, you can see in the top left corner and what I'm holding in my hands are just paper straws. They were white at the store. We elected to spray paint them with a metallic silver aluminum style paint to kind of better replicate the tin. They're about seven inches in length so we decided to cut them in half because all we have right now is our cohorn mortar so that's about the size we'll need to start to work with. What I was referencing there is when you cut the straw in half 
where I'm now cutting, the straw kind of crimps down upon itself. So we're going to cut that end and not the opposite end, which is still uh, wide open. You know, we don't have good flow for the fire, so we figured we'd work from the end that we kind of already damaged in cutting it. And you can see here what I'm now doing is just making a bunch of little cuts. I'll call them fillets or however you want to say it. But we're just going to open it up like so, kind of keep them as uniform as possible so that they're nice and flat. We're going to take a ring reinforcement, the type that you would use to reinforce a torn piece of paper and a three ring binder. We also painted them to match a bit of an aluminum color just to kind of give it a little bit more of an authentic look. And we're going to stick those to the little segments of the straw that we cut open and splayed out. You really want to push down on them. I suppose you could add some glue if you needed to, but just make sure it has some good adhesion. Otherwise, the whole thing will kind of fall apart. So that's step one, as you can see. We got a couple others that we have made, and we're going to make a few more before we move on to step two. All right, step two when we make our tubes here is uh, pretty simple. All you want to do is just cut off the excess straw that you cut open, like so. Pretty simple task, but it's important. You can see here as I manipulate the tubes that not all the little pieces of straw were cut the same width, nor were they cut to the same distance. I think if you try to pay attention to how deep you cut these little segments from the end of the straw, it'll make these steps a little bit easier as the three ring reinforcing sticker will have more of an easy time sticking and not be too short on one end and too long on another. So here we go, a couple of these, and uh, now we're ready to uh, introduce some powder. All right, as we move on to the first part of step three, you'll see I'm manipulating some string. Uh, the NPS has a manual that I believe they published in 2016, which is titled the Manual of Instruction for the Safe Use of Reproduction 18th Century Artillery and Historic Weapons Demonstrations. And they have a chapter in that uh, PDF that's called the Artillery Laboratory. And one of the things they talk about is making fuses. And the method they speak of is using a string. As you can see here, I'm cutting the string into about three inch long segments. This is just regular old twine, doesn't need to be anything fancy. And what we're going to do when we have the string is we're going to add some glue to it and that way the black powder will stick to the glue. All right, you can see here, I just have some regular Elmer's white glue that I'm just running the string through. You wanna make sure that the string is good and coated. Uh, the more glue, the more black powder you'll get to stick to it. So let's bring in some black powder. What we're using here is some GoX 3F powder. I suppose you could use 4F, but for these purposes, it does appear that 3F works just fine. And you really wanna get it good and coated. Here I'm just using one hand, so I have glue over my, all over my left hand, but you get the idea. Just coat the string thoroughly in the black powder, and then we'll set it aside to dry. Okay, so while we wait for our string to dry, we're going to discuss and, and demonstrate a second method of making a tube. Uh, what we have here is just an ordinary Avery label. We're going to cut it in half lengthwise down the middle. And what we want to do is just flip it over and put the sticky side into the powder. And you'll see here in just a second how we do that. I think once I flip it over, that was probably more than enough powder. This is gonna get folded up really tight and inserted into a tube. So adding more powder here is probably an unnecessary step. We just really wanted to illustrate it for the purposes of the video. So there we go, plenty of powder. We'll shake off the excess. And that's basically the now the inside of our tube. So we're gonna kind of give it a crimp, fold it up kind of like a canoe here. Take our tube. And then once it gets started, it's super easy. It slides right in, and like so. Just slide that right up into the tube. And you can see that that kind of creates a channel of powder inside the straw or tube, which would lead right from where my finger just touched there to that end that I'm manipulating, which would be right directly above the main charge. Also important, make sure you can see through this. You do not want to have any obstructions inside of this. We're making fuses, not firecrackers. So. You can see all the way through, perfect. That's a good fuse that's ready to go for the next step. All right, now we're ready to add powder to the top of the flange. What we'll do here is we'll open up the Elmer's glue, and I did not open it up nearly wide enough, as you can tell, so we'll fix that here in just a second. There we go. And just add a gentle, light bead of glue all the way around. We're gonna spread it out with our fingers so you don't have to go too heavy here. 
There we go, just spread it around. I'm also just kind of squeezing to make sure that the straw pieces there that I cut open are really adhering to that uh, sticker. And all we're going to do is turn it upside down and dip it right into the powder. And as you can see now, we've added powder to the top. This will be the part that sits on top of the cannon, which we will touch the linstock or port fire to, to set off the main charge. So having a, a good area of powder there uh, makes a good target and will ensure a good ignition. Okay, now that these have dried for a day, these will be ready to use uh, for firing uh, artillery pieces. And we have the two types here. You can see this one here is the uh, string type. The string kind of dangles beneath it. And the label type also it extends a little bit more. I suppose you could cut that flush if you want to, but decent powder adhesion on the top. Uh, really makes for a good uh, target to hit with your port fire or your linstock. And then obviously the tin tubes uh, from Goose Bay Workshops here. Um, and you can kind of get what we're going for in terms of mimicking the design. Obviously, we're going to use these in scenarios and reenactments and not these. When you fire the cannon, the pressure will shoot up the vent, and you don't want something like this flying into a crowd and injuring somebody. So these are disposable. They're made out of paper. They're biodegradable. These are the way to go. All right, real quick, actually, before we go outside to try these out, what you're looking at here is a cohorn mortar. This is our uh, cohorn mortar, which best represents the 4.6 inch cohorn that was used in the American Revolution. Uh, and you can see the vent hole is right here. So if this were the 18th century, we would take our tube and insert it into the vent. This one's obviously long and it's kind of bottoming out in the powder chamber. This is a very small powder chamber. The actual fuses that we've made, and this one doesn't have any powder on it because I don't want to get any loose powder in here or inside in the basement, just inserts into the, just like that. Nice and flush. You take your linstock and touch it to this. That would ignite the powder around the top. It would enter the tube channel and then conduct the fire all the way through the bottom. So let's go upstairs, take a look, and I think you'll really like it. All right, here we are outside. And as you can see, the ignition is really quick. It is less than a second. And you can see that good tongue of flame come out of the end of the tube. As we slow it down, you really get to see that good tongue of flame. These, these tubes look like they're going to really work for us. I think they're going to be really effective. Here we have a look at the inside of the cohorn, the powder chamber, and the touch hole. Flash, really quick. This slow-mo video here is really great. You can really tell where that fire would have pinned upon the blank charge. I think these are going to work really well.